Greetings, I'm your host, Jason Miles, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. So glad to uh, have you guys here with us tonight as we're going to have a very fun and informative conversation about something that many of you may know that I'm a huge fan of, Star Wars. The Star Wars universe, all of it, the animated shows, the new shows, We'll not be talking about the books because that's for nerds. <laughs> but earlier this week, we kicked it off with the sometimes why of TIR, Paul Prescott, a sometimes writer of Jacobin, talking about his piece uh, that came out recently about the GI Bill. And we discussed why it's important to get the history right around the GI Bill and the New Deal as well. Then yesterday, we got to do a surprise episode with my good friend and sometimes band member, Conan Neutron, where we discussed the early beginnings and what killed grunge music. Um, we even got into a little bit of streaming talk, live music talk. It was a very, very good time. You guys got to get a glimpse of what it's like to be in a tour van and at a venue. <laughs> <laughs> and before the show with me and Conan, we're like that all the time. That's why he is one of my best friends. Um, please check that out. If you're enjoying what we do here on TIR and you've already subscribed and you're a patron, thank you so much. You are the engine, the gasoline in the engine, of the TIR machine. If you'd like to have access to champagne rooms past and present, be part of the live audience for the Pascal Robert Mau Mau Hour. And of course, join us for movie nights, be part of our call-in shows, and just have fun hangs. The last champagne room, which got taken down, I think it got taken down because it was so much damn fun. Uh, I did put the video up, the raw video is up, unedited. Um, become a patron for as little as $3 a month and $30 for the year, it can all be yours. Now, let's just get right in to the Star Wars talk. I know you guys are ready for the nerd talk. Now, if you don't know, I am reading a script, so I can't see if there's any Star Trek fans. If there's any Star Trek fans right now saying stupid Star Trek shit, stop it. Don't do that. It's not a Star Trek show. Gene Bajlan does all the Star Trek stuff. You save your Star Trek talk for him. It's a Star Wars thing. The Star Wars franchise is now the ire of many as the once countercultural narrative of a primitive rebellion against an all powerful, technologically superior empire was director George Lucas's science fiction version of the Vietnam War. The rebels, Luke, Han, and Leia, were the Viet Cong and the Empire, the big bad in the entire Star Wars universe, is the United States. In the 90s, Lucas attempted to relaunch the franchise by making three prequels, which had mixed reactions among fans of the original three movies. But uh, this time, Lucas wanted to explain how a society becomes authoritarian. And definitely, he wanted to explain taxes. Because if you couldn't get through the first of the prequels, it is it is a hard watch. But it is about taxes and trade agreements. So there's that. Again, many of you know that all of the Star Wars properties are owned by Mickey Mouse. Has that changed Lucas's vision of the universe he created? Star Wars and Marvel Comics, both major Disney properties, aren't just fodder for the under 13. Everyone knows of the movies. Them and their merchandise are ubiquitous in American pop culture. That being said, does that take away from the importance of the main Star Wars universe? Can we as leftists use these stories as grand narratives to energize a young and easily influenced left? I have some guests here with me to help parse this out. First, let me bring in the first ever live stream guest. I started doing live streams a long time ago. This was my first live stream guest. 
please welcome the author of Welcome to the Rebellion, Stay Alive. And I don't know, I haven't talked to him in a while. And unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to really talk that much before the show. If his third book, which I have manuscript for, which I love, is out for, the, for you guys to read. Because I still love that book. Please welcome Dr. Michael Harris. <laughs> Good morning, Jason. Good evening. Did you ever get the third book out? Hopefully out this year. It's <gasps> just a review. Some random academic who I don't know the name of is currently reviewing it. So my fate is in their hands. But it's about it's about sci-fi and the future and why we didn't listen to the messages of sci-fi films from the 70s in particular. So hopefully out this year. If you want to see an interesting show where we talk about that book... Michael, myself, Dan Larson, Marcus of the Left Flank Vets. We all had a great conversation about that and sci-fi a year ago, at least a year ago, two years ago. Maybe I was a bit low energy because I'm in Thailand and it was like midnight. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to go to bed. Well, so. now Michael's all hopped up on PCP, so we're going to have a great show tonight. <laughs> Speaking of PCP. He is the leader. <laughs> I mean, a people caring person. Uh, he is <laughs> the author of an upcoming book <laughs> on sublation media. Wherever you are watching or listening to the show, there are links in the description. I believe it's called The Death of the Millennial Left. Please welcome Professor, I believe it's Dr. Chris Catrone. Chris Catron. Hi, Jason. Hi, guys. What's going on, Chris? Uh, a lot. <laughs> so you mentioned Death of the Millennial Left. Coming out but it's not, it's not officially out yet. That's just your copy. Ah, there was, there was a preliminary print run of 100 copies. Special collector's editions now. Did you sign them? Some of them I did. So how did does does one know they get a signed one? Is it does it is it is it listed as a signed copy or? No, I signed it on the spot. So yeah, in person, not not beforehand. So we'll see. Uh, I have to get my book signing signature down. You I do. don't have that yet. You do. Yeah. You have to get it down. You have you have to get it down because when you're doing your your book signings from all your famous podcast appearances, you don't even want to look them in the eye. Don't even look them in the eye. Just sign it. Name. Mm -hmm. Go about your business, <laughs> like like the big shot that that we all are here. Um, I'm going to start this off. I want to I want to ask uh, Michael this question. You were my first live stream guest three years ago. I did not know that. Uh, yeah, and and I believe we did that first live stream when there was a horrible fire going on in uh, in the Bay Area. Well, actually, it was in Northern California, so the entire sky was red. It looked like total recall outside of my house. I don't know if you it remember It was like that. Blade Runner. Yeah, it was, it was insane. It was insane for a few days. It was very gross. Um, I still recommend your book, Welcome to the Rebellion. Actually, there was a, a house guest I had maybe three, four months ago here. And uh, as she was leaving on a, on a journey, she was asking for some book recommendations. And I just... I said, this is my copy. This is like the third time I bought it. Um, please read it. It's a, it's a great book. She definitely loved it. Um, there's also, like I said, there's also links in the description for that book as well. Now, have you checked out any of the new shows? Last time we had spoke, you hadn't even seen The Mandalorian or, or Andor. Have you checked out shows like Andor? Yeah, I saw Andor. I saw the first season of The Mandalorian, but I really got into Andor. It was kind of a slow start, mm -hmm. and then it really picks up. And I think it's the this is Star Wars we like, if I may speak for us all. Mm -hmm. In that it's it's not about the kind of monarchical family battle Jedi Force stuff, which you know it's, it's about <clears throat> being oppressed. Uh, yeah, the fag end of the universe and what it feels like to live under an empire. So I, I really got into it. And then the themes of 
you know, committing to resistance and, and rebellion. I liked it. I liked it. Now, Andor is interesting to me, and I haven't finished it. Um, because it, to your point, it doesn't really talk about the monarch, the 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 the, the monarchs. It's more about you know senators and then the the bureaucracy of the empire. Um, of course, you know rebellion from the ground up. Because when we watch Star Wars as young kids, um, we just saw scrappy rebels that had dope jets and they were all unified and fighting. <laughs> we don't know how they got there. We don't know who the Botham spies were that lost their lives for the plans. <laughs> we don't know any of that stuff yet. We just kind of get brought into the story, you know, episode four. And, but we understand it's a battle of good versus evil. Chris, you had mentioned Andor when we were doing our uh, preliminary talks about putting this show together, which I do have to send a huge shout out to show producer who is not here tonight because she was like, look, Jason, I love you. But you know, <laughs> I don't watch the movies in general. And I definitely haven't watched this. Right. Um, but she, it was, this was all her idea, and she did a, you know. So again, shout out, thank you, MT, for putting this together. This is like a little birthday present for me. But Chris, mm -hmm. you enjoyed Andor. Oh yeah. No, I was excited even before it came out because it was coming out of Rogue One, mm -hmm. and I loved Rogue One. You know, I'll just say, why did I like Rogue One? Everybody dies. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, when Saw Gerrera dies, I'm yeah. like, okay, it's on. You know, none of these are going to come out alive. Um, now, Michael, you talk about in your book, Welcome to the Rebellion, you don't talk about the sideshows aren't even out yet. And you definitely don't talk about the animated stuff. But you definitely talk about all of the, the movies, the, the feature films. And you talk about Rogue One. Uh, I do have to say, um, uh, Rogue One's writer and director, or the writer of Rogue One, is friends with Conan Neutron, who was my guest yesterday and was a guest on his show, Movie Night Extravaganza. Mm -hmm. And I have mentioned to him, hey, you want to pass that info along? So we're going to do another one of these with the actual writer of Rogue One, because I know we all want to dig into. Cool. He also wrote Book of Eli. But um, yeah. what did you like? Chris about Rogue One besides everybody dies it's right. also a, a non-Jedi story right what did you think about Rogue One well you know it's about the rebellion and it's about the ambiguities the moral ambiguities of the rebellion um mm. and Cassian Andor in particular you know is kind of a dark figure mm -hmm. right he's ordered on an assassination that mm -hmm. he bails on at the last minute he changes his mind about and he, you know, dresses down um, Jin Erso and says that she has no idea, like, what sacrifice mm -hmm. is involved in the rebellion. And so now we're getting the backstory in the TV show about, you know, his, you know, how did he become this character? And, um, you know, Spa Guerrero, who I mentioned, is also an interesting figure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's different from the mainline, like, Jedi theme. Um, although they do have the um, Guardians of the Wills or yeah. dudes. And they're, they're interesting, too. They're interesting, too. Um, I mean, although they're somewhere between... A, they're like a chorus kind of set of figures who, you know, kind of comment on things and there's a little bit of humor. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, I thought that that film... I mean, it, it tied in a little bit too neatly with uh, the the first Star Wars, you know, the way it sort of seamlessly leads up to the... Look, you want to watch Star Wars when it's over. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's good, um, you know, but uh, no, I like the fact that the, that the rebellion was shown as more morally ambiguous mm -hmm. in character. Um, and they're getting into that with, with Andor as well. There are these dark characters in the Andor series as well in the rebellion. Well, rebellions are messy. Uh, Mike, what's your, uh, what's your take on uh, rogue one Andor? I like one of the themes in both of them as Chris said, is the, it's the price of resistance. It's the price of rebellion. It's the cost that people pay and the complexity of that. And also there's, there's quite a lot on kind of revolutionary tactics and, and strategy. How do we, mm. 
how do we do this? Do we try and do this from the inside? That's the Mon Mothma character. You know, you have the Stellan Skarsgård character who's, who's, who feels he's given up everything for this. Mm -hmm. And it will cost him. And then you have the Andor character who doesn't want to get involved, you know, but over, over the course of, I think, 12, 12 episodes is, is drawn in. And it's a, it's a really interesting contrast to the original Star Wars, well, A New Hope, as you said, because none of it in Star Wars, A New Hope, it happens really quickly. Mm. You know, uh, Luke is radicalized, as it were, really quickly. And there's almost no debate about, am I going to get involved in this? He's a bit whiny at the start and says, I can't. <laughs> Only because um, Aunt Beru and Uncle Owen are killed. That, like, yeah. Sets him free to get involved, Luke. Sets him free to get involved, but there's no, there's no kind of you. You might expect maybe if that was made today, there would be this big debate about <laughs> should I get involved in this? Is political violence ever justified? No, he's he's straight in after his uncle and aunt are uh, 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 killed. And I write about at the, uh, the start of my book the deleted scene, which you can find online, oh, yeah. which actually casts. Exactly. Luke in a slightly different way because he's having this conversation with Biggs about you know we always talked about resisting the Empire and getting involved and they and they cut that out for pacing Biggs. reasons but it shows he's he's on the edge of rebellion already and it makes the thing dramatically make a bit more sense but that's much more what Rogue One and and Andor kind of have time to explore when the first film doesn't. Uh, you mentioned you watched uh, Obi Wan, Chris. Yeah. And Obi Wan, um, we didn't know what that was going to be from the trailers, right? We were kind of like, okay, this is going to be interesting. How are they going to tell this story? And uh, I, I don't do the spoiler alert thing on this show. I feel like if you haven't seen it, then you're not going to see it. I mean, it's been out for about a year now. Right. Um, to, it's not like you were waiting and all of a sudden I ruined it for you. So we'll right. just tell, we'll tell all endings, you know, but uh -huh. it's, it's, uh -huh. it's okay. Uh huh. Everyone will live. Uh, no, Obi-Wan was interesting. I mean, they foreshadowed a little bit of it in the um, animated series rebels. Loved rebels. I love, yeah, that show is great. And um, you know, I liked the clone wars, but I really liked rebels a great mm -hmm. deal. And um, because Obi Wan, you know, at a younger age on Tatooine, watching over Luke's childhood, mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's some depth and dimension there. You know, there's a kind of a final confrontation with Darth Maul, and you know, a kind of release, you know, from Maul at the end. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, um, and something similar happens in the in the live action show with Obi Wan with Reva. Yeah. And, um, you know, I watch these series. I'm never quite sure whether I like them or not, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Reva is a little bit much at first. You know, she's a kind of a very uh, kind of sadistic, ragey kind of character. Reminded me of um, Dude from The Force Awakens, Kylo Ren. Right. And you remember all the memes with him, like losing his shit and chopping everything up. Right. And so, you know, really kind of annoying that way. You know, Kylo Ren, it's kind of absurd. <laughs> you know? And Reva was kind of edging on that. Right. And so you want to like her, but then she's kind of petulant and kind of like, eh, I don't like her. Kylo <laughs> Ren is filled with uh, fuck you, dad energy. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's just all very... The J.J. Abrams stuff is just all very dire, in my mm. estimation. It's just a little bit much. But anyway, getting back to the Obi-Wan, like, you're not sure what the story is really about. It's about him protecting the girl, you know, Princess Leia, as a mm. small child. It's kind of annoying. She's sort of cutesy annoying, too, right? And so it's got all that stuff, all that Star Wars stuff. It's got the kind of cutesy stuff, and it's got the serious stuff, and you're not quite sure, you know. Um, Andor is more the adult series, but Obi-Wan is more like the full, the full range of appeal, you know, to the audience of, you know, all ages. Mm -hmm. And so you're not sure what it's really about. Is it going to be about Obi-Wan and Leia? Well, but really it ends up being about Obi-Wan and Reva. 
and Reva turns out to be, and they kind of show in the beginning who she is, but you don't really quite catch it because you're not sure whether it's the backstory about Anakin and Obi-Wan, but she's a youngling. She's a, she's a Jedi youth. Mm-hmm. You know, Jedi youth. <laughs> you know, who, who escapes the massacre at the temple, you know, and, and is traumatized by Anakin, you know, turning on them and, and slaughtering the younglings. Um, and then it turns out she's getting her revenge on Anakin by being one of Darth Vader's henchmen, mm-hmm. you know, an, equi- an inquisitor, which they in- introduced that concept in Rebels, right? They had introduced, and the Grand Inquisitor is a character that's introduced in Rebels and shows up here, doesn't play a very major role. And he's an interesting character because he's, an, he's a Jedi Temple guard. So yeah, who are these people? The They're all in yeah. Jedi, right? Well, okay, so do you think the uh, let me ask you this. Do you think the Inquisitors and I don't know if you know about the Inquisitors, uh, Michael, because I know you didn't watch all the animated stuff. Do you think the Inquisitors are important characters in the canon? Okay. They're like uh Sith assassins, you okay. know. So they're like, uh, I guess in the extended universe, there are these figures mm-hmm. who are not really Sith apprentices, you know, mm-hmm. but are more like the Sith assassins. And so they're kind of one step below a Sith apprentice. So they definitely are like dark side force users. You know, they have lightsabers, they can do shit. Um, and so the Inquisitors are hunting the surviving Jedi. And then, you know, you don't know where they come from, but then it's sort of revealed, okay, they're kind of ex-Jedi, fallen Jedi. Mm -hmm. And so you know that about the Grand Inquisitor from the Rebels series, but, you know, it's not clear where Reva comes from. Um, But then it turns out, you know, again, she's, she's a survivor of the massacre of the younglings, and she's offering to help Darth Vader hunt down Obi-Wan. Because Mm -hmm. it turns out Darth Vader is obsessed with getting obi-wan that he thinks obi-wan survived and you know he's got his get back I mean, that's why he's he's getting, you know, he's just torso. darth vader is portrayed as in full sadistic rage mode in the obi-wan series total like he's in the full froth of dark side stuff and he's already being kind of chastised by palpatine for his obsession with getting obi-wan but anyway reva you know puts herself forward as I'm going to help you get Mm Obi-Wan. But really her plan is to um, put Vader in a position where she can take him out. Mm -hmm. Right. So she's the way Obi-Wan puts it is you're not hunting me. You're hunting Vader. Mm -hmm. Um, Setting him up. And then it turns out that Darth Vader knows who she is and realizes what she's doing. And, you know, um, almost kills her, leaves her for dead, but she survives. And then she goes after Luke as a child. You know, she she goes back to where Obi-Wan is hiding out, you know, Tatooine. And then um, there's a redemption at the end. You know, she chooses not to kill Luke. Mm-hmm. And so she redeems herself and she's sort of released of her burden by Obi-Wan. And she she abandons the, the Empire. She abandons the Force. That's the idea. She's not going to be a Jedi or a. Is is the in the in your opinion is that part of the Disney spin on that that was maybe unnecessary? Or do you think that's a necessary arc to have? I mean, my understanding is that a lot of the pieces are in place, like I said, in Rebels, and mm-hmm. that Rebels is the last series that George Lucas had a hand in. Right. So mm-hmm. um, I think that it's it's integral. I don't think it's Disneyfication. I don't. Okay. Um, I do think that it's it's part of the the overarching story, and it ends up being part of the story of you know Obi Wan and um, his kind of journey because the series is also about how he's forsaken mm-hmm. being a Jedi, but then he has to sort of come back. You know, he has to dig up his lightsaber in the desert and come out of retirement and re-embrace. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, and I'm always a sucker for Qui-Gon Jinn. And mm-hmm. you know, the force ghost of Qui-Gon Jinn makes an appearance. Right? Well, let me ask this question. I'll start with you, Chris, and then I'll pivot to Michael. Um, 
Why do you think there is a lack of these kind of grand narratives in, on the left? And why do you think we need them? Especially now. Well, that's a complicated question. So these like actual mm -hmm. myths, you know, like um, a kind of mythic narrative. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we need a mythic narrative, mm -hmm. but we might need a grand narrative of history. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the question is whether the grand narrative of history is a myth or not. Um, you know, the way that I always like to put it relative to postmodernism is that postmodernism is against grand narratives. The grand narrative that they're really against is the grand narrative of Marxism. Sometimes it's posed as like the Hegelian grand narrative or like the Western grand narrative of history, but really it's the grand narrative of Marxism that postmodernism rejects. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the question. The question is, had the historical viewpoint of Marxism become a kind of ideological myth in the 20th century, such that the postmodernists would feel like they should reject it. In other words, I'm not just saying that they were wrong, mm -hmm. saying what, what became of the Marxist view of history, it seemed to become a kind of ideological, mythological narrative rather than a, a really critical view of history and capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, and so the postmodernists rejected it and they really rejected a kind of a Stalinist narrative of history that is very kind of triumphalist and progressive. Um, but maybe it's meant to be more um, critical and, and analytical and kind of cold, the original Marxist narrative. So that, that would be different from like a mythical narrative, because obviously someone like George Lucas, Star Wars is in the business of a kind of mythic narrative. Mm -hmm. and, and blurring the distinction between a mythical kind of legend and, and history, right? And mm -hmm. so, but again, he is, you know, dealing with ideology. There's also the question of like films, the cinematic form itself. Does, does cinema mythologize reality? Is just putting mm -hmm. a camera up and filming, does that mm -hmm. instantaneously turn reality into a kind of myth of itself? It might. <laughs> Michael Moore would say yes. Right. You know, um, so, and I do feel like Lucas, you know, the, the piece that I wrote for Sublation mm -hmm. on, you know, in defense of the Star Wars prequels, mm -hmm. you know, I just point out like George Lucas is not just a naive filmmaker the way someone like J.J. Abrams really is. Like he is a very self-conscious, he was an avant-garde filmmaker. He came out of the American new wave, you know, and he's, a, he's an old new lefter. And he's a new leftist. I mean, obviously, his political sensibilities, you know, kind of rad lib. I put him in that category. You know, he's not a Marxist by any means. His conception of capitalism is kind of really kind of lame. You know, it's just greed and corruption. Mm -hmm. um, although most of the left, we have to admit, has that kind of very simplistic, infantile, lame view of what capitalism is. But besides that, you know, he's a filmmaker. And so he's sort of self-consciously deploying the mythological character and the ideological character of film. He's sort of working in and against that, you know, mm -hmm. um, in a way that is very self-conscious and so might transcend his political ideology and end up giving more, you know, cinematically than, than he might be able to explain himself. And before we, before I ask this question to Michael, can you show, so one thing I do admire about Chris, I'm, I shouldn't say it, I'm jealous <laughs> because I at one time had tons of figures and ships and had to sell them all. Um, can you yeah. show, I know you have a figure next to you, you have a figure or ship next to you. You want to see? Say hello, to my, say hello to my little friend. Chris has all the figures and all the ships and if you're uh if you follow him on social media he'll definitely show you your know, models he's putting together so so this is Ravis ship yeah this is the inquisitor ship and that's dope that's a yeah, dope ship. it's very cool i mean obviously the sith stuff is just great you know? i gotta get you on with dan larson one of these days on uh, on secret mm -hmm. show a secret galaxy because you know dan's a huge toy guy absolutely i now, mean michael you, you wrote a whole book about what we're talking about and the importance of grand narratives. So uh, I was going to read a little bit of your book, but you know what? I'm like, no, we got Mike here. Why do I need to read the book? 
Let's let Mike explain. Let's let Michael, Dr. Harris, explain um, why these narratives are important for a, a left that's just struggling to find itself, find its way, if you will. Yeah, I, well, I think we've got so good at kind of cultural studies deconstruction we are inherently suspicious, understandably so, of anything that comes out of um, creative industries, mm -hmm. which, which obviously are, are businesses, especially when they're owned by a multinational corporation. And, you know, part of this goes back to, if you're into it, the Frankfurt School and so on, that, that this is, and Gramsci, this is a... Um, an aspect of capitalist reproduction. But we've got so good at seeing the, the capitalist and class-based messages in cultural products that it just struck me that we were missing uh, a really obvious thing about Star Wars, which is that it's, it's a story that comes out of the new left. Mm -hmm. And Lucas wasn't part of the new left. Someone earlier in the chat said Star Wars is space liberalism. Mm. I, don't, I don't think that's quite right. What it is, it's, it's, lib it's a story written by a San Francisco liberal in a revolutionary moment mm -hmm. and about the need to take sides um, and to take sides really quickly against the machine. And it's, it's so kind of obvious that it's about that. And I wasn't obviously the first person to note that, but I just thought no one had ever captured that in a whole book. And and I thought, well, why is that the case? And it's I think it's because we we've become so good at deconstructing grand narratives that we kind of miss the opportunities in in using them. So it, it it's not just that I think we should you know try and use star wars type storytelling in our politics although you can do that uh i think it's about how the hell is it that the right and the hard right in particular are describing themselves as a kind of rebel alliance against mm -hmm. the empire mm -hmm. when that's our story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so did they the right are telling that story much more effectively than we are, How and that's we... why they're still arguing about Star Wars and keep the politics <laughs> at this out point. At this point, yeah. the power of culture. That's right. How do we take it back? Well, first, how do we take it back? First, we got to recognize some things, which is, um, you know, so the sublation article that I wrote was about, mm -hmm. you know, keying into what I was talking about earlier, the moral ambiguities of history mm -hmm. and of politics. And sometimes the good guys become the bad guys. Mm. Right? And that's really why the prequels are, for me, vital, you know, because they show that. Mm -hmm. They show the good guys becoming the bad guys. And, um, and there are twists of history th in which that takes place. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, so the story of the 20th century in terms of moral ambiguity is one of the anti-fascist alliance falling apart and turning against each other in the Cold War. Mm -hmm. right so the mm -hmm. soviet union and the united states were on the same side against um the axis and then they turned against each other and then it was quite ambiguous you know people on the left people on the left actually did take sides and did regard the enemy as like the continuation of the old fascist enemy mm -hmm. and it's a kernel of truth to it you know i mean it's it's you know whatever the cold war is a mess but i think that the new left had to had to navigate that had to deal with that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and didn't always resolve it very well, right? And we don't know really what the results of history are until after the fact. You know, it could mm -hmm. be, you know, um, you know, the sort of balance sheet is in hindsight, you know. Uh, and so I think that that, I think that he honestly struggled with that as a theme, right? In other words, not 
So the first three films, you know, from from my the original, childhood, the original three, yeah. are pretty much good guys and bad guys. Although, yes. interestingly, Darth Vader is redeemed. Yes. All right. Yeah. And so, but you don't get into the moral ambiguities of the rebellion, not at all, right? So, but the first, the prequel films, you know, in terms of the the story order, mm -hmm. they are all about this. And I think that that made it hard for audiences to swallow because I do think that they want a clear good guy, bad guy kind of story. And Lucas was kind of withholding that. And that's why it became too political, too cerebral, too about this and that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, well, no, this is actually, and it's, oh, and, and he, the way he described it is that that was the story he always wanted to tell. In other words, he 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 really did want to start with those, but he didn't because he realized his ability to depict that universe was limited in the 70s. And so, you know, it's a funny kind of thing that he wanted to show the Republic. He wanted to show the Clone Wars, but he just didn't have the technical. Right. That was that's the way he's described it. And so I do think that, you know, again, for us, um the question of like the grand narratives of history and also of the sixties, I think that the sixties generation, I mean, he wasn't a leftist George Lucas, but I think he experienced the shock mm -hmm. of, Oh, the Americans might be the bad guys like between the civil rights movement mm -hmm. and the Vietnam war. It's like, we thought we were the good guys. Maybe we're not the good guys. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know, the deep, <clears throat> character of that rather than the superficial character of that so it's not just a matter of switching like saying oh no the good guys are now the bad guys and just clean reversal it isn't it isn't and so i think that if we can bear that view of history and of politics and therefore of narrative story making can we bear that mm -hmm. right can we can we bear that kind of ambiguity and drama and tragedy really there's a there's an interesting thing so after reading your book michael everything i watch star wars is always a little different right after reading i think i said this you know go back and i think it's episode 70 you know we're on episode 442 now um <laughs> and um where where you make me go back and watch the prequels with a different eye and there's a couple reasons why i watch the prequels a little differently i have younger children mm -hmm. and um i rewatched everything with my four-year-old and he was so enthralled with the first we went from one to you know nine mm -hmm. or so enthralled with it because it is very colorful but um there's something about what you say um about one thing that they do get done in the movies, which is the outer rim is kind of like the ghetto <laughs> and there's inequality in the outer rim. And, and most of the Mandalorian takes place in this no man's land um, of the outer rim. And then I think it is the second season of the Mandalorian. You you're seeing the beginnings of what's going to be called order, or the new order, whatever they're called. I forget what they're called. Oh, the first, the first order, whatever. Yeah, the, which is the new empire, the imperial right? remnant. Yeah, yeah. And one of the the themes that are going through these scenes is the destruction of the second Death Star killed millions of innocents, which is a concept that seems foreign but with shows like you know robot chicken they joke about it i think the family guys joked about it where of course there's regular people on the death star there's <laughs> janitors on the death star <laughs> workers yeah there are workers yeah there's just workers on the death star mm -hmm. and um that is the motivation for for these people to build this thing back is that these these rebels killed innocents and they're they were the enemy um 
What's your what's I, I know you you kind of explained I, you didn't get that into it because you didn't watch Mandalorian when you wrote the book. I don't even think it was out when you wrote the book. But um, what is your take on that idea, Mike? Michael? Yeah, well, so this is this is why. The Republic, the new Republic is so vulnerable, right, because mm -hmm. it hasn't because it's still a highly unequal society that has these these vulnerabilities there is still a galactic elite on coruscant who don't seem to be doing anything for these um hinterlands mm -hmm. and and there is a lot of anger and corruption and and this is the the seeds of uh the resurgence of that anti-elitism which obviously fascists Ironically, paradoxically, love to seize on us, this, us against the elites. Which this is where, for me, this is where I try to use Star Wars to explain things to people, or where this is where I, I really want to hear what Chris has to say about what I'm going to say right now. Um, if you look at a lot of the conversation in the media, in the 90s, there was a gang problem and a crack problem, I'm using inverted quotes as I say that. There was a gang problem from California. There was. There definitely was, there definitely was a, a someone that has dodged his fair share of bullets. There really was a, a violence issue. I don't know if the crime bill was the answer. I don't think it was. I think it had some unintended consequences, right? I do think something's going to come down the pike, but I don't think it's going to be on the federal level. I think it's going to be state by state that are going to be much heavier uh, crime bills because we're seeing more and more reports of, of, of violent crime. And I think New York, this incident is kind of uh, that just happened where a, a young man got uh, choked out to death on a subway train. Um, I think he was mentally ill and was having an episode someone came behind him and choked him out and it's, it's horrible. It's horrible to, to, to hear that that happened. Um, but we have to also understand that um, people feel uncomfortable. This isn't to justify anything. People do feel uncomfortable uh, on public transportation in major metropolitan areas. Um, there is a feeling to, for a lot of people that the inmates are quote running the asylum um, in San Francisco, we just had uh, the murder of a uh, big time uh, tech CEO. Right, right. And and the narrative in the tech community was this is what happens when you don't you know put people away. You know, as we found out, it's uh, no, it was the normal, it was, <laughs> it was, it was normal it was, it was, murder by you know, mur murder. Murder is yeah. very different from a you know people yeah. stealing stuff out of a CVS. Those are two different things. No, but also, we had a situation in San Francisco right where someone stole something out of a CVS, and because there's armed security in a lot of these places, uh, they got murdered. Security guard killed them. Mm. Right. So authoritarianism. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a it's a strong it's welcomed in. And, it, and it's it's always welcomed. The second ninety four was welcomed in. And when you watch these movies, because of the inequality in the hinterlands, because these people have to operate in this literally wild west, that's the scene that's painted. Um, there's scenes in the I believe it's the Mandalorian where there's people that you know want the empire to come back. They're doing the dirty work of this up and coming empire because they want to see the lawlessness stopped. Um, can we use Star Wars to explain that, Chris? I mean, to some degree, um, authoritarianism is a theme. Uh, like I said, in the original films from the 70s and early 80s, it's not really, you know, explained. It's just sort of taken for granted that there's this kind of authoritarianism. Um, in the prequel series, there's more of a, you know, engagement with that about the republics, you know, descending into empire through a state of emergency, basically, mm -hmm. um, and through a kind of militarization of society and militarization of the Jedi and, you know, that idea. And so, again, you know, it's if if we were to think that in the United States, that the authoritarianism is only with the Republicans, <laughs> we'd be wrong. And mm -hmm. again, 
it, it seems like both sides regard the other side as the authoritarian threat. And yet to meet that threat, they also embrace their own authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, what we experienced with the 2020 election and January 6th, as well as before that with COVID, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's been an embrace of social media censorship. There has been mm -hmm. among, among Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so again, it's kind of like, well, which side is more authoritarian? They're kind of competing to be the most authoritarian in some ways. It's just that they're competing over the justification for authoritarianism, which is a, a demand coming up from the people themselves. Mm -hmm. right? um, and, you know, I'm an Adorno scholar, so I would be remiss if I didn't point out that anti-authoritarianism also has its authoritarian character to it. <laughs> <laughs> right there is such a thing as um authoritarian anti-authoritarianism right um what does that look like well it's um it's this it's basically a kind of hyper conformity mm -hmm. it's a kind of peer group kind of i mean i that's the way i experience like pc identity politics i don't experience it as just pitting groups against each other but mm -hmm. groups policing within themselves like, you know, who's authentically black, who's authentically mm -hmm. a woman, mm -hmm. you know, um, I mean, this is very old fashioned. But when I was at Hampshire College, there was this idea, you can't really be a feminist unless you're a lesbian. Mm. It's like, holy shit, you know. So, mm -hmm. again, that kind of authoritarianism, in other words, authoritarianism, not in the in the way that we usually think about it, it's like a hierarchy, <laughs> but more in the sense of a conformism. Okay. You know, and that there's a sense of, you know, the people need to be policed. I mean, I think it was Jimmy Kimmel who said last week or two weeks ago, he said, you know, the people who don't want to be told what to do by the government are the people who need to be who most need to be told what to do by the government. <laughs> and it's like, holy shit, that's a recipe for disaster. You know, and so again, just seeing that um rebellion might have an authoritarian dynamic to it as well right um mm -hmm. that that again uh and i think the history of the 20th century shows that you know stalinism shows that it does show the uh, you know a kind of left authoritarianism that is demanded by the people it's not imposed from above it's demanded from below right so that has also affected the left the socialist movement in, in its history it's something yeah. to be aware of and, you know, again, the idea is that this is not like just a, a moral failing of individuals. It's more like capitalism conditions us to be terrified, traumatized, and therefore authoritarian. I mean, that's what I saw with the little bit of footage I saw that thing in New York. Uh, Michael, yeah. do you, I'd love to hear your take on this. Uh, well, on the authoritarianism of the of the left and conformity, I mean, I just don't, I just don't think they're equivalents. Uh, I'm not saying okay. Chris was saying they're equivalents, but um, I mean, any any group has a kind of aspect of conformity. That's what being part of a group is, and there's some kind of policing that goes on. And obviously, the the right is seizing on that in mm. terms, of, you know, this idea of the woke mind virus and and so on and that, and that plays very well to a certain kind of alienated young yep. man who 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 then is very attracted to drawn into hard right politics mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i just i just don't worry about it too much i just i just don't think it's as important i i bring i bring it up i bring it up because again being leaving a community where we just just had a massive sweep of hundreds of homeless people that have been living there probably about 10 years about 10 years that camp got really really big and the camp actually had got to the point where so many different people were creating kind of 
true mutual aid services. This isn't just mm -hmm. charity. This is true mm -hmm. mutual aid services that they probably should have been getting some state money sure. to do some of the things that they were doing to to help people, you know, eat, <laughs> even yeah. even help people get placed in shelter. And then when you're placed in shelter, help with those services to keep you in uh, your home because, you know, these homes come with rules. Um, and to see the sweep of these people that are living in an area that is not near residential or even apartments. It's, it's an industrial area they're living in. Oh. You know, it looks like a scene from Judgment Night. Um, if you remember that 90s film, um, I was living illegally in a warehouse <laughs> across the street from them. So, so you know, um, and I was there because we could make a bunch of noise and, and do music stuff. Right, right. So, so right, right. to see these people get swept up like they did, and, you know, we've seen other violent sweeps in this area, or at least I have, where there was this group of women called the Moms for Housing. They had commandeered a house that was owned by a multinational corporation that owned several single family residences that were vacant in, in a place where housing is, is a, a hard to find commodity. Um, they had gotten one house and they got another and, and then the, the owners, the corporate owners were trying to get them out and they ended up calling the police. The police came down with a, a like a cop tank and a battering ram to get oh women and a small child out of a house. Um, the bad press caused them to actually sell the property to the uh to the city hmm. which the city then bought but cities cannot afford to constantly buy um these properties in a place like uh los angeles mm -hmm. um who had a lot of build out in the 80s during the uh mayor bradley years uh, one of the covenants was if you wanted to get these tax subsidies to build these properties, um, you had to have a 30 to 35 year covenant that you would make uh, a portion of your your housing or all your housing, quote unquote, affordable. Those covenants are coming due. Tens of thousands of units. There, there was one whole building um, that that came due and people's rent jumped literally overnight without warning because you would have to read not your rental agreement, but the property covenant. Um, to protect yourself from that. So we're seeing more people forced out. We're seeing more petty theft and property crime in major metropolitan areas. Um, and there seems to be a call from the people for more protection, inverted quotes. That's where I bring up the whole authoritarian thing. Yeah, the backlash is horrible. I mean, in other words, like it's almost like a setup. Like sometimes, you know, so I'm gay. And sometimes mm -hmm. I feel like, are we winding up a backlash? Is that yeah. what we're doing? Are we pushing the envelope and winding up a backlash? Because, you know, uh, I mean, you know, getting back to like Star Wars and George Lucas, you know, he's kind of lefty sensibility. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it can also look like libertarianism. It can look like, you know, a kind of, there's a kind of an anti authoritarian kind of vibe to it that can, can, can be embraced. You know, I don't think that it, it can't be embraced by like a kind of libertarian right. So it's not about false equivalence. It's about each side claiming that the other side is a threat to fr to freedom. Mm -hmm. Right. And then people embracing a curtailment of freedom, supposedly to defend freedom. Right. And so it's about that kind of manipulation. It doesn't mean that the issues are equivalent, but it's more about how politics is conducted. And it's conducted at the level of like psychology and fear mongering and treating, you know, the other as this like inhuman threat, basically. Um, and, you know, I'm just very wary of that, you mm -hmm. know, like I feel like, okay, well, the Democrats champion like my side, you know, they defend people like me, mm -hmm. but I'm not happy with the way they do it. You know, you, and you mean you mean a gay man with credentials? Yeah. Well, sure, absolutely. <laughs> credentials. You know? Yeah, yeah. Not just a gay, but a gay man with credentials. Yeah, with a PhD, whatever, in mm -hmm. academia, you know. Um, although that's a racket too, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so it's just you know, it's one of these things where I feel like I wish politics were conducted 
in a more sober, pragmatic, realistic way, as opposed to in a kind of histrionic, psychologically manipulative way. But it does seem like that's our fate, especially right now, you know? Well, that's what's got me a little worried. So, I mean, did yeah. you want to uh, respond, Michael? Well, we don't talk enough about liberation. Right. Mm. Right. Uh, and and so, yeah, we sometimes appear like uh, we're policing people in terms of uh, what they say. But I, but I think that's more the. But in reality, you know, it's a few people on Twitter, right? And it's it's mm -hmm. more the stuff that Fox News and Bill Meyer and those kind of people tell a story yeah. about the left because yeah. you know, someone at a university got kind of politicized by their sociology course in the first year and and sent a tweet. I mean, who? <laughs> I, that's not that's not really the mainstay of. Um, more radical leftist no. politics it's not what we actually talk about most of mm -hmm. the time but it's right. but it's how we're depicted but you know uh, that's your your opponents will yes. um depict you in the worst way possible anyway. you can't really do anything about that we just need to talk about what we care about and essentially that's liberation for people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't we talk about liberation for people? Is it because we really do feel we've been liberated through the market? <laughs> Speak for yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you mean neoliberalism has co-opted uh, liberty and freedom, mm. right? But in a way that uh, you know generates a lot of cynicism about such things. You know, I, I mean someone sent me a, a personal message and they uh they said man jason i'm really upset about the way people are you know talking about this gentleman they got uh killed in new york you know they didn't care about him when he lived well there's and, that and, and that's the way i felt about george floyd as well it's like you know I, I worked with george floyd's i have george floyd's right. in my family and and yeah. you what the fact that that guy got choked out so easy, I, again, I haven't seen the whole video of people because, oh, the video people were trying to stop the guy and they didn't see a crazy man or someone deemed, cra deemed crazy, right. deemed homeless. I don't care yeah. what color you are. Right. Um, and you're smaller. Yeah. There's always a tough guy that's going to, you know, uh, God forbid you walked up to a woman having your episode um there's always a tough guy that can't wait to try out a new uh hold they learned at their uh mma fitness class Man. and uh i don't say that flippantly i say that right. with nothing but anger and right. frustration um it it because i want to know what people's what is the proper response to a to a man that no one cared about beforehand there's hundreds of thousands if not millions of people like this i definitely worked one-on-one -on -one every day um with cats like that um and i and i know what it's like working with them and i know how the general public deals with them for the most part it's the general public that's calling the cops on these people right when they when they walk into the uncomfortable situation like I'm, i just want to go to the store and i don't want to see someone begging i want to say yoda yoda says fear leads to anger anger mm. leads to hatred and hatred leads to suffering mm. i mean you know i mean it's really um i think i also think you know we've been put on edge again we've been kind of set up haven't we you know mm. We've been put on edge the last few years, and it is a setup for a backlash. That's that's quite scary, I think. Um, and so, uh, you know, it feels like the 70s. It feels like asking for some kind of authoritarian response. And again, it's it's in some ways worse. You know, because we did have January 6th and because, you know, Trump is a different kind of figure than Reagan. You know, there is this kind of populism or whatnot. 
And um, so it's really tricky. And I also think that, you know, the system, the political system looks very rotten. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that, you know, in the 70s, it looked rotten and there was cynicism. Mm -hmm. But I feel like now there's also a kind of attempt to say, what's wrong with you that you think that there's something wrong? Right. In other words, if you if you say shit's getting worse, it's like, well, what are you a Trumpist? <laughs> it's like, wait a second, you know. Well, and so the well, left is going to be blackmailed into this position, and that's that's the that's the part that you know I find really daunting, you know, yeah. where it's going to be like, okay, we're going to have to defend the status quo against the Trumpian fascist threat, and it's like, you know, the status quo is not good. You know, it's problematic in the states in the West in general. Uh, Michael, do you have any parting words? That is, that is the that's actually dramatized in Star Wars pretty well. Mm -hmm. Defending the status quo, mm -hmm. the, the some some people describe the Jedi as kind of liberal centrists trying to keep the whole thing together, and, and of course they they don't see the threat, they don't see it coming. It's coming from within the system. Uh, it's about fear. It, uh, it, it's that fascist movement which, which always draws on fear and magnifies fear and says, we need order. And that is the moment. But on a hopeful point, mm -hmm. um, well, is it hopeful? You decide. <laughs> What's the percentage of the Trumpists? 20% maybe? maybe 25 percent yeah the hardcore yeah mm -hmm. um we are in our varieties the majority mm -hmm. and and that kind of relates to i think star wars as well we can't we can't quite grasp the fact that we have this story that is incredibly popular whatever you think about the the quality at, at, at certain points but it has been enduringly popular that is a that is a rebel story about um the need to act against corporate funded driven authoritarianism and the dangers of fascism always coming back. It's our story. Mm. It's a majority story. And we're so used, you know, historically to being kind of on the losing side. I don't think we can quite believe it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Now, so is that hopeful? I don't know. I don't know, but it's not. <laughs> I mean, I find Star Wars more hopeful for, for us to use as, as a narrative or just hopeful in general than the Marvel movies, which, you know, there I had a little bit of hope for Falcon and Winter Soldier, and I was like, oh, they just turned those people into uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> like That sucked. But hey, thank you guys for joining us. We've been here an hour talking serious talk you guys thought we were just going to nerd out about our favorite scenes and why we thought the scene <laughs> we got sucked in part one we tricked you we pulled got you, you. that yeah. is what i've been trying to do with this for four years now um will either of you gentlemen be joining me in the champagne room sure. yeah okay yeah uh i'm gonna open up the phone lines because this chat was humming and okay. i definitely think people should call in and sound off if you're not a patron you don't want to be a patron for whatever reason subscribe it's free it doesn't cost you anything it's a passive gesture that goes a long way but leave a comment if you're listening to this on the playback leave a comment let us know what you think let us know what your favorite star wars movies are no star trek comments just don't leave a star trek comment you're policing again. You're policing. This is why we get a bad reputation. You know what? I'm going to police this. If you <laughs> look, look, every time you leave a Star Trek comment, Brianna Joy Gray's lighting gets better. Oh, sure. just remember that. <laughs> You're making it worse for me and better for her. <laughs> She's double Harvard. She doesn't need anything else. All right. Just remember that. <laughs> Thank you guys. Cool. Thanks for, for hanging okay. out. I'll see you guys. Just go ahead and click that other link I sent you. Cool. Out of here. And we are out.